to the computer. Okay, so we are recording. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. okay. And sharing. Okay, and and so I think my answer, uh, you know, to this question, and the question being, you know, why why is it okay to target this at the sort of at, at the end of the road here, um, is because all we have to do is break the replication cycle. So it doesn't really matter where we break it, because once we stop it from replicating, it it stops from replicating. Now, yes, it may be into the the may have integrated into our our DNA. But that is only in a number of cells before we actually stop it from, from successfully replicating um, and, and spreading basically and, and growing and, and the virus growing. The other reason I think that protease inhibitors are advantageous, well, well like as a treatment is because the, their side effects are pretty minimal because they're specific. <laughs> they're very specific. It's really easy to target HIV protease specifically because proteases have a very specific mode of action. You know, they, they snip a protein at certain recognition sites and we can specifically target the HIV one and not like a human protease. That's kind of my, my get, that's what I get from this. The uh, reverse transcript, uh, the reverse transcriptase, um, inhibitors were always a little toxic. And that, that was kind of a, in the early, like in the eighties, I guess, when, when HIV was, was really a, a big new problem, all we really had was AZT. And it, it causes some kind of toxicity because it, you know, it's, it's acting like a, like a nucleotide and it's kind of like, there's anti-cancer drugs that do the same thing. And, and they're just kind of nasty in your body, right? The other targets are actually not that bad. The Fusion, the HIV fusion, that one is also fairly specific. So when you have specific, you have fewer uh, um, side effects, right? So anyway, I think nowadays the protease inhibitors are, are really cheap to make. I'm pretty sure, yeah, you can take them orally, which is nice. Fusion's a peptide and you got to take it as a shot and just people don't would rather not have to get injected with drugs. Um, and I don't know the current status of the integrase inhibitors. This is another, another type of HIV drug, but they're also often given in cocktails. So you can get a few at the same time. So I don't know, my, my takeaway is I think the protease inhibitors that they're effective and they have few side effects. So like what's, you know, what else do you want really? Um, so, yeah, any other questions about this? Should I ask a follow-up? Yeah, yeah. Um, would you say that in that case, just based on your explanation, like determining where to target any drug to any like um, disease would be finding some sort of balance between, like you said, like cost effectiveness, method of delivery or like convenience and then efficacy, um, like finding a balance of that with like, minimizing like the negative effect on this on the cells or the host as much as possible so like it might be that allowing the um viral rna like to go through the entire like reverse transcription and like integration into like the host dna like that might be to some extent using up valuable resources inside the host cell and like may affect the host cell negatively in some way but it's like up to us or like up to medical professionals, obviously to like find a balance between like mitigating those negative effects as much as possible while also like keeping in mind like the efficacy and like the cost effectiveness and, and the convenience of any drug. That's, that's my, definitely what I, what, the way I feel about this all. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, it is a balance and, um, and yeah, if, if something works really well, but has bad side effects, that's generally bad. And also, uh, yeah, route of administration, um, a simple pill that you can take once a day to basically cure your disease and let you live a normal life. I mean, that's, that's you know, that definitely solves the problem with HIV, which used to be a, a very life shortening disease, right? Um, uh, we'll talk, uh, we'll talk about COVID later also. And 
you know, some of the good COVID drugs like remdesivir are injected and that just makes it a little more complicated. If there could be a, you know, an effective oral pill that, you know, that would, that would uh, kind of prevent, prevent infection and have an antiviral effect, that would be really nice too. And that's actually happening. Uh, as we'll see, COVID also has a protease. Co uh, COVID-19 also has a protease, which is also a potential drug target for COVID-19 infection, but it hasn't been, there hasn't been a really good inhibitor that you wouldn't take as like an injection, for example, right? But maybe in the last couple of months, I saw in the news that Pfizer actually created an orally available COVID-19 uh, protease inhibitor. Uh, it's in clinical trials. It's gonna probably, you know, change things around a little bit. I mean, the, 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 uh, the uh, vaccines are really good, so, but having an orally available treatment w would be great also, you know, that you would just take if you got, if you got COVID-19 and have mild symptoms, just avoid hospitalization or whatever. Um, yeah, yeah, but uh, generally speaking, everything's a trade-off, uh, you know, between efficacy and side effects, route of delivery, um, and, uh, and cost, <laughs> it could be the best drug in the world, but if it's thousand dollars a pill, then it's not going to work too well. Yeah. So ease of manufacture and that comes down to synthesis, right? We, if, if it is a easy synthesis, three or four steps from a dirt cheap chemical, that's really cool. And most pharmaceuticals are actually three or four steps, maybe, maybe upper to 10 steps from cheap materials. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. All right. Any other questions about this? Cool. Yeah, this is a, a, a nice little scheme. I mean, there's a lot of complexity to HIV, and but this this does nicely show what the key uh, drug targets are. All right. So let's keep on going now. All right. And again, we're doing this kind of silly organization of, of, of drug, you know, uh, showing, uh, presenting drugs kind of in the order of how, how you learned organic chemistry. We'll keep doing that. Um, here and there, it doesn't seem too logical, you know, but, but, we're, but, but we are reviewing our organic chemistry at the same time, which I think is always a useful thing. All right, so uh, let me see here. I wanna switch my video to my webcam. All right. And I'll, I'll have the chat window open, but if you, uh, if you have any questions, just uh, speak up and I'll, I'll, uh, we can talk. All right, so we were on number two, which was reactions of, of um, you know, uh, basic organic reactions. That was the SN2, SN1, E2, and E1 reactions. And that was in Volhart Shore, mostly chapter uh, six and seven, I guess. Now we're on. We're moving forward into the Volhard and Volhard Shore text, into uh, chapter eight, and so this is reactions. Um, and and as you as you would learn organic chemistry in Volhard and Shore, you first start learning yeah these basic reactions, and you start going into like alcohols and uh, ethers and all those kind of fun things. So this will be in the Volhard and Shore book. It's alcohols, um, kind of the concept of oxidation. Reduction. Grignard, we'll, we'll see that in a second. I think we reviewed Grignard a little bit before. It's just a, a nucleophilic carbon. It's like a, a carbon that goes attacks, attacks an electrophile, like a ketone or aldehyde or something like that. Uh, a little bit about ethers, 
a little bit about, I think maybe epoxides. Epoxides. Epoxides, of course, are these little three member ring things that look like this. It's a cyclic ether, allows to be attacked by stuff. It's a, it's a cool little uh, building block that you can you know, use to attach stuff to a molecule. So this is kind of what, what I'm going to say is VS8 and VS9. Well, for sure, chapters eight and chapter nine. Okay, so let's start with something easy. Um, and another uh, common pharmaceutical. This is called a bupropion. Um, this is a, one of the modern classes of antidepressants. Second generation, second generation anti depressant drug. It's also called a Wellbutrin. Wellbutrin. Okay, so this is this will be an example of this Grignard idea. You know, a, a carbon attacking a carbon, basically, nucleophilic carbon. So uh, I think I'll draw the, I'll, I'll do what I did before. So I'll draw the product and then kind of work our way back to the starting material. So the product is benzene, chloro, ketone. All right, that's a pretty easy molecule. So it's, yeah, bupropion or albutrin. And it's uh, used for um, major depressive disorder. So pretty severe depre depression incidents. Also, seasonal affective disorder. Which is like when you um, um, kind of like get depressed during the, during the winter and, you know, uh, different seasons, I guess. Uh, it's also used in smoking cessation, randomly. So it's just kind of a, a general sort of uh, psychoactive drug used in psychiatry. Okay, and it affects, it, it's actually a norepinephrine agonist. Norepinephrine agonist. Norepinephrine is one of the neurotransmitters. Agonist basically means it's not an inhibitor, but it's an activator, right? Okay, so anyway, uh, to make this drug, they basically attach two different things. They attach the nitrogen. There's a little squiggly line to suggest that is, that's one thing that gets attached. And the other thing that gets attached is this carbon piece. So like the nitrogen thing gets connected and then the, that, that bond also gets created by Grignard, okay? Okay, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna go from the beginning and, and end up here. All right. So this is actually a pretty easy little synthesis. All right. That's a nitrile. Nitrile. Remember that nitrile. It's one of the functional groups in organic chemistry. Nitrile. And and you might remember that nitriles can be attacked by a Grignard reagent. Grignards uh, attack these things and they make ketones. So if I just use, how many carbons are we gonna attach? Ignore the nitrogen, how many carbons that looks like? Two, right? We're gonna attach two carbons, one, two, to that other carbon, right? All right, so we essentially it's MGBR, ethyl Grignard. All right. And so the Grignard, you know, the, the mechanism is just plain old organic chemistry. It's just a nucleophile. It's essentially that carbon attacks that carbon, right? 
carbon attacks carbon. But I usually circle the bond and say, okay, that bond attacks and kicks up, kind of like that. All right. Um, now the end result is a ketone. That's pretty easy, right? But how does it make it? How does it go from nitrogen to oxygen? Uh, that's what the water does, right? So there is a little intermediate here, and I'm just going to say AR for aromatic ring. Something like that, and then water attacks this. Water. Attacks. Okay, and so there's a little bit of a replacement of the carbon nitrogen to the car so to the uh, carbon oxygen. Yeah. Okay. Cool. And then you get a ketone. All right. So that's pretty cool. So now, now we're, we're what do we got to do next? We just have to magically attach that nitrogen thing, and that is actually not possible directly. You cannot directly attach a nitrogen like that. But what we can do is think about, well, well, I mean, if we had nitrogen there like that, say we had that, right? Say we had that piece, how, how could we attach that to this? We have to make a what kind of group? Something that's gonna attack and kick off, right? Nitrogen would attack something at that position, kick it off, and then we have this. What kind of group is that called? Uh, it, it's something that leaves, so thus it would be a kind of, a leaving group, right? So we need to somehow convert, you know, we have to add, add a leaving group. So if we have a leaving group there, then the nitrogen kicks it off and everything's cool, right? So this is basic <laughs> organic too again. Like if we had a magic way to convert a carbon to a BR, Then, then we could kick off the BR and make this stuff, right? Well, that it was a reaction you learned also. You can turn, you can attach a bromine to a carbon next to a ketone, and then just use BR two acetic acid. So that was like a, that was a VS eighteen. That was a, a reaction in the. Chapter 18. Ah, so you add a leaving group and now we have a leaving group. And then and then it's just a matter of attack it with this nitrogen thing, right? Terbutylamine, right? It just attacks and kicks it off. So that's cool. Swings around. Uh, there we go. Kicks off the uh, leaving group, and there we go. So it's pretty easy little synthesis, right? And that demonstrates the use of a of a, a Grignard, a Grignard, is, which is this. This is the Grignard, right? To attack a nitrile. All right, cool. That's that's pretty easy, and it's a a, a major uh, um, antidepressant that's used commercially. All right. And let's, let's uh, now talk about a, a different class of drugs, but they have a fun little a synthesis. Also using some of this alcohol and the oxidation and reduction and, and like ether chemistry, all right? So any questions on this one? Be cool? All right. One second. Okay. All right. So now we're still on this uh, number three reactions, uh, the alcohol and ether stuff. Next one we're going to talk about is. Um, 
is uh, one of the opioid analgesics. So it has interesting biological activity. It's used in surgery as a, one of the like shorter, short acting opioid analgesics. Uh, this one's called uh, alfentanil. This is not fentanyl, which is a related molecule. So this one is not really used, or, or not, to my knowledge, it's not really used uh, um, or a, a substance of abuse, I guess, because it's very short acting. Um, it's a short acting opioid analgesic. It's a short acting opioid analgesic. So it's used, um, it's, it's rapid onset, so it's it's injected and then it in, instantly has its effect. Um, but it's also short acting, so it, do, it doesn't last very long. So it's not really that uh, used as a uh, um, like a, a, a drug that's abused. But it is used in surgery. Okay, so, and it's also very simple chemistry. It's very simple chemistry to, to make this molecule. Um, um, it does uh, cause respiratory depression, as a lot of the opioids do, respiratory. So it's, it's used very carefully in a surgical setting to, to avoid like an accidental death or, or something like that. And, and, you know, in surgery, um, anesthesiologists know how to do this very well. Okay. All right. So let's, let's look at the structure of this thing. And we'll talk about uh, the, the simple organic chemistry used to create it. All right. So alfentanil, alfentanil. So it's uh, ethyl group, nitrogen, uh, carbonyl, nitrogen, Nitrogen, double bond nitrogen, nitrogen. All right, some weird little five member ring there. And then we have carbon, carbon, nitrogen. Oops, let's uh, redraw that a little bit right there. Carbon, carbon. There we go, six member ring. We got an ether with a methyl group, nitrogen, amide, phenyl group. All right, it's a fairly uh, simple molecule. Uh, it has a, uh, it's called, it's called, um, like I said, alfentanil. It has a couple other aliases, uh, Alfenta, uh, Rapifin. Okay, and um, as you may or may not know, how do these drugs work, these opioid analgesics? They, they bind to the, uh, uh, one of the opio opioid receptors. So it's a agonist again, agonists kind of activate things. And it's, it's an agonist of the mu opioid receptor. Mu opioid receptor. And this is the way pretty much all of the opioid analgesics work, like morphine and codeine. Um, um, oxycodone, hydrocodone, things like that. They are agonists of this receptor and that causes the analgesic response. It also causes the respiratory depression that could potentially um, uh, have a you know, lethal side effect or something like that, all right? Okay, so let's, let's use our organic chemistry and sort of think about like, how would this possibly be built? I mean, it looks like we kind of have a left piece, we have a middle piece and we have some right stuff and you just kind of imagine disconnecting things and that's exactly what happens. So we can disconnect this piece, the little piece right there. That's easy bond to make. It's really easy to connect nitrogens to things. Uh, we can also, what they do is they, uh, they also make this bond. 
and we'll see how they how they approach that. But it's basically going to be making an ether. Um, yeah, cool. And uh, also, they can make this bond. Okay, so essentially, they're going to uh, attach the left piece, this kind of right piece, and this other right piece to a central building block. Okay. Um, I will show the, the relationship of this to the molecule fentanyl. Fentanyl is a, the more abused substance nowadays, and they do have a general kind of uh, structure similarity. Um, it is interesting, if you ever looked at morphine or, or codeine, I'm sure you guys have seen the molecule. These don't look anything like them, right? This molecule, as well as fentanyl, they really don't, but they bind to the same receptor, which is pretty crazy. I mean, it's just, you know, a little bit of the magic of chemistry that a molecule like this and versus like morphine would, would basically have this, attach to the same receptor and have the same uh, analgesic effect. Okay, well, let's just draw fentanyl. Uh, for comparison, because it actually does look similar, but it's uh, fentanyl is a, a longer acting drug and, and they're very potent and has all these uh, kind of lethal side effects um, and respiratory depression problems. Okay, so what's, what does fentanyl look like? It's a benzene on the left, it's dead. Carbon, carbon, nitrogen. And then nitrogen. Amid phenyl, and this is fent fentanyl. Um, I think interestingly, I didn't notice this before, but yeah, the, the names are slightly different. This is a YL and this is an IL, I guess. That's a, one little difference. But the structures actually are, are kind of similar in some ways. You have this six member ring with the nitrogen, six member ring with nitrogen. This just has this other uh, group over here, which I think, aids in its uh, excretion. So it, it, your, your kidney is able to uh, kind of attach to this or, or uh, filter out this kind of polar uh, heterocycle, right? And that allows this to get excreted more rapidly than like this benzene. And a benzene is a greasy thing that, that you know, can absorb into like plasma proteins and things like that. So that's probably why this is a short acting opioid and this is a longer acting opioid. Okay, um, but just a little bit about uh, fentanyl. It's, uh, it's also a uh, potent, very potent. It's extremely potent. It's maybe, I forgot, it's a uh, hundred or several hundred times more potent than morphine. And that's the problem why, it, why it's abused. Uh, and it's easy to make. The, 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 the synthesis of a molecule like this is actually pretty pretty straightforward, and that's why a lot of uh, illicit drug labs are, are making it. Okay, it is a potent mu opioid agonist. Um, major abuse potential. Major cardiovascular effects. Uh, it's very controversial right now. Um, a lot of states have a huge opioid epidemic and it's mostly caused by fentanyl. Um, that, that said, it is still used in surgery. And I, I, had, a, I had a finger surgery <laughs> actually in January and I, they gave me fentanyl as my, my drug during a surgery. So it is definitely used in a surgical setting very responsibly, but it's also um, used uh, illicitly too. Anyway, let's, for the re review of organic chemistry, let's just kind of go back to alfentanil. We'll show the, the cool little synthesis of this molecule to show that how, how easy it is to make, um, you know, simple molecules like this. All right. All right, so I'm just gonna go in the, we're still, we're still in number three reactions, alfentanil. Uh, I'm going to go in the forward direction just to show the, the kind of rapid construction of this molecule. They uh, start with this very simple molecule, which is a ketone and an amine. 
of course, molecules like this that, that can be used to make these kind of drugs are heavily controlled. So the the you know the purchase of these kind of molecules is very very uh, um, you know, the, the, the manufa chemical manufacturers carefully watch these kind of chemicals as well as the uh, government agencies. But anyway, uh, through a couple steps, I'm just gonna uh, show just how they attach the, I'm gonna skip a couple steps, that's what I'm gonna do. All right, so we got, I'm just gonna, uh, uh, abbreviate a couple steps there. And they were able to attach the, make an ethyl ester. Okay, there we go. And so they, they kind of attached this, this is actually a protecting group. So this is a PG protecting group that they're gonna remove. Um, and then they're going to turn the the ester into an ether because remember there's a it was a, uh, a methyl ether so this will be converted to a methyl ether and then they uh i think that's pretty much it yeah there's maybe a little little more to this all right so once they've done this which is actually pretty easy stuff attach protecting group and they they use a nitrile and a couple other little steps to get to here uh, now, now the the fun organic one stuff comes in. So they do lithium aluminum hydride. What does that do? Anybody know? Lithium aluminum hydride is a reducing agent. Did anybody know what you reduce here? It's not that, but it does reduce one of these guys. Which one? The ester or the amine? So this was definitely an organic two thing. Uh, it, lithium aluminum hydride reduces C double bond O's. So it, it reduces this and it does it a couple steps. So it attacks, it kicks up and then does it, you get it, you basically get an aldehyde then it does it again. And basically you get an alcohol out. So I'll just draw that, yeah. Cool. So you get an alcohol. Okay, so lithium aluminum hydride is usually there's a water or something in there. All right, so we cool with that. It just converted addition of a ester to an alcohol. Ester to an alcohol, yeah. All right. Yeah, so we said it. Somebody direct messaged me. Yes, the ester is the reducible functional group there. And now you get an alcohol, right? Well, now, this goes back to organic one. Um, how can we convert that alcohol to a methyl ether? How can we convert an alcohol to a methyl ether? Because we're, make, we're making an ether, right? We're making an ether. This is a something ether synthesis, the synthesis of a ether from an alcohol. Um, may not remember it, but it's very simple. It's, all we're doing is we're attaching methyl with a leaving group, right? Methyl with a leaving group. And I think somebody says, uh, somebody in the chat said ICH3. That's right. All we're doing is methyl with a leaving group. And a good leaving group would be I, right? Methyl iodide. Iodomethane. And so that's a, that's step two. So it's ICH3. That's right. Step two is ICH3. But there is a step one that we're forgetting here, or we should review. And that is like, you got to take off the proton. So you got to use a, a super duper base, take off that proton, and it makes an O minus. And then the O minus attacks the carbon, and then he makes the ether. So it's NAH, NAH. All right, we cool? That was pretty straightforward as conversion of an alcohol to an ether, right? All right, so now we have our methyl ether, we have our amine here. And then they, um, this one you probably don't know, but it's a really easy reaction. It's just deprotection.
deep protection of the this group. That's called a, this is called a benzyl amine um, protecting group. PG protecting group. PG is just a uh, yeah, it's a group that we're temporarily tying up this amine with. And we got to we want to attach something, so we got to take off the protection protecting group. So this is what we call a DP reaction. DP, deprotect, deprotect the benzylamine, right? Um, so this is a protecting group you've probably not seen before unless you've taken a synthesis course. Um, uh, but it's really easy. It's just H2 palladium. H2 palladium on carbon. And there is a cool mechanism for this. We're going to skip all that. But yeah, it, that's how you take off this benzyl amine protecting group. All right. Um, anything else to say there? Oh yeah, yeah, th this is a good good point. I mean, we also have this thing here, right? Phenyl nitrogen, right? That doesn't seem to be taken off, right? It's like, it's, it's really, th only this thing on the left. <laughs> What's different about this thing on the left versus the thing on the right? And you see anything that's, Different. Hmm. What's that thing? The little tip of the. Oh, I see on the ring. Somebody said on the ring, but that's that, that's true. This is kind of on the ring, but that, that's not really the the issue. The issue is the CH two. See the CH two there, and the CH two is kind of important in this deprotection. So when you have a phenyl CH two, that's what we mean by benzyl. Benzyl. Definition of benzyl means benzene. CH2. So benzyl means phenyl CH2. That's the definition of the word benzyl. Okay. Phenyl CH2. This is not a this is not a benzyl because there's no CH2. And that's the lack of the CH2 is what uh, causes it to react with this, not that. So it's just a weird organic chemistry thing. And that benzyl has special reactivity. Okay, so we're cool. I think I think there's only one one last step. This is a you know, like I said, pretty easy. No, it's two steps. Two steps. It's pretty easy chemistry and all. It's all organic one, organic two. This is your this is an SN2 reaction here. So it's um, chloro carbon carbon. Okay, so what's going to happen here? You got a nucleophilic nitrogen. You got a carbon with a leaving group on it. SN2 reaction. Plain old organic one. Chapter six in Volhard short. So, and what's the mechanism? It's really easy, right? Nitrogens are nucleophilic. That carbon with a leaving group is electrophilic. So circle your lone pair and attack. Kick that off. And now we've formed a bond from nitrogen to carbon. SN2 chemistry, right? Um, what does that make? Oh yeah, the last step, I'll just draw, I'll just sneak in as an, an extra arrow here. Um, last thing they have to do, which I, if you look at the, the original structure, they have an amide on the nitrogen. So it's, it's just, uh, it's a propionic anhydride and base. So what that does is that it makes an amide off the nitrogen, uh, three carbon amide. So nitrogen, carbon, 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 and that makes that just to attach to an amide. And that's the final product. So abbreviated structure, nitrogen, Wow. That's the full structure, basically. So they just attached this little amide thing. That's what this does. Okay. So yes, this is a easy, easy chemistry, like most pharmaceutical chemistry is. All right. Good. All right. That's that's the final molecule. All right. Um, 
Now let's switch gears to breast cancer. All right, any questions on this? I'm kind of watching the clock, but if I like go over, just stop me. <laughs> just let me scream at me or something. Okay, so we're still in number three reactions. Uh, alcohols, ethers, etc. Okay, so now let's talk about um, a molecule called tamoxifen. Totally different biological activity, but it follows the kind of chemistry discussion we're, we're, we're having here, which is kind of like alcohol and ether synthesis. Um, so tamoxifen is a uh, selective estrogen receptor modulator. Um, and that class of molecules are called SERM, S-E-R-M, SERM. Modulator, what does modulator mean? Like, does modulator imply inhibition or activation or any of those things? Like, why, it's probably doing, some, the molecule is probably doing something to the receptor. So why, why would they use the word modulator instead of saying, activator or agonist or antagonist or something. Any ideas? Well, the answer is that it, it's a uh, inhibitor sometimes and an activator other times. And that's what we mean by modulator, right? It can inhibit some receptors and activate other receptors, but uh, it is used as a breast cancer drug and it's got a cool, very short, Synthesis, okay. So it reacts differently to the estrogen receptor ER in breast tissue. It is an inhibitor. And in uterus, and liver, it is an activator, which is kind of weird. So it has this sort of differential activity, but, but overall, it's a very nice breast cancer drug. I have a quick question. Yeah. Um, what made, like what kind of cells or what type of receptors that made um, the drug decide whether it should be an inhibitor or activator? Like, yeah. that a That's a great, great question. And I don't have an answer. I can try to maybe look that up for next time. Um, but it's, you know, I mean, it's the same receptor and there, there's just, I think there's like downstream effects and, you know, other other things around in, in various tissues that would cause that. Um, but and just, I'm sure there's a very elegant answer. I just don't know the second. But yeah, so that is weird. I mean, it's the same. It's the same receptor. It's the same protein. But maybe other other proteins in the environment will affect the the, the conformation of ER, um, and uh, maybe the downstream elements are a little different. Yeah, but that's yeah, it's interesting. And this kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier. You know, like. Uh, if we're inhibiting estrogen receptor in one tissue, and that's having the desired effect of treating breast cancer, but we're activating it in another, the question is, are, you know, are there side effects associated with this second activity? And are those side effects severe enough to, you know, not do this? And from what I understand, um, it's, it's okay. And I think the, um, I think like the uterus effects are maybe more if you're pregnant. So it's like, um, so, uh, treating somebody with breast cancer that's pregnant 
might be more problematic, but if they're not pregnant, it's not that big of a deal, you know? So, but, but it is a balance of side effects versus efficacy, so. Uh, but yeah, I don't, I don't have a good answer on, to, on why ER would act differently and, you know, with this kind of weird molecule. And what's, what's even crazier is, you know, estrogen receptors so sounds like, well, oh, it's gonna bind to a steroid, right? Right, the, a steroid, and we'll show that. We'll show the steroid, I think it's a estradiol. Um, and it looks totally different. The molecule looks totally different from the drug, which is also weird. Okay, so, so let's, let's show the chemistry real quick. It's, it's easy chemistry. We like easy chemistry. Um, I'm gonna, uh, I'll draw the molecule first and then we'll, we'll show the synthesis, all right? Okay, so, so the final drug is called Z tamoxifen. Z tamoxifen. Uh, so the molecule is nitrogen. Pretty simple little molecule there. Um, what? What does Z mean? Z, what's that referring to? Anybody know? Uh, the structure. The what? The structure of it. Uh, the structure, but yeah, but but Z versus what's the opposite of Z um, in a molecule like this? There's Z and there's E, that's right. There's E and there's Z, it's very easy, right? Um, and uh, Z, and what does it mean? It's, it's, it's about the alkene, right? So it's kind of like, it's a stereochemistry of alkenes. It's not normal, not the stereochemistry we're used to. Uh, and uh, somebody said, I think there's cis or trans, but it, it, and Z is actually, the word Z, does anybody know what language Z comes from? It's a European language. Um, I only know this because I, teach organic one, <laughs> German, yeah. And it says Usamen, which is in German, that's probably misspelled, Zusamen, which in German means together. And together means cis, and in terms of uh, alkene structure. So the way you do that, and the, the way you understand that, Z versus, versus, what's the opposite of Z? We said E, right? Like, like we'll say versus like E tamoxifen. And E tamoxifen would be, uh, I think it's antigagen, German for, I think it means opposite. And that would be more like closer to trans, okay. So what does Z mean in terms of this uh, structure? Um, so the basic idea is, you know, we, we, we look at both sides of the alkene and we, we kind of like cover up like the right side. And then we, um, we use the rules that you use for stereochemistry, like uh, prioritization, to basically figure out which is more higher priority, the top one or the bottom one. Well, you know, the, the rules, there's all those rules, we're not going to review all those. But the main thing is uh, like the, like in the, if these are the same, we just kind of walk around until the first point of difference. And of course they're the same, except here we have the oxygen and this other stuff. So the top actually wins, the, the wins the priority, right? The so top wins the priority, right? And we do the same thing on the other side. And the benzene and the multiple carbons there and the double bonds, that will win. So the top wins here. So top one's here, top one's there. And that's what that's why we how we get Z, right? A cis. It's basically the idea of a cis. And so these these high priority substituents are on the same side. So E would be the opposite alkene orientation, which is like if the we flip the right side. So benzene down here, ethyl group up there. Okay. All right, cool. So that's that's um Z tamoxifen. So uh, synthesis of this molecule is pretty easy. And I think they just, they build the alkene and then they just kind of snap it all together. So it's a, it's a couple steps and I'm gonna draw that on the next 
next page. Okay. Okay, so we're still on three reactions, mostly kind of alcohols, ethers. And we're on C, tamoxifen. Okay, so it's plain old Grignard chemistry. They, uh, to build the, the carbons of the alkene, right? They wanna build the carbons of the alkene. So they start with this ketone with the ethyl group and a phenyl group. Nice little molecule there. When they do a Grignard, a plain old Grignard, right? Cl, Mg with a methoxybenzene. So this will construct Kind of the uh, well, that's actually. I think this this is actually going to be the two carbons of the alkene. I think that's those are the two carbons of the alkene eventually. But uh, this thing attacks. So I get my second color out, blue. Circle the bond. It kind of swings in and attacks. Kicks electrons up, and then that O minus gets a proton from water. Right. Okay. So, but that just makes an alcohol, right? And um, okay, so now you can see, you know, this is going to become the alkene, right? these two carbons are gonna become the alkene. So how do we do that? That was something we did in the last lecture. And I think when we talked about the tricyclic antidepressants, uh, it's pretty easy to, um, to convert this to the alkene. I'll just draw that product. Okay, how do we do that? Anybody remember? Like, how do you, like we wanted to take that alcohol and make it into water, like add an extra proton, right? Add an extra proton to it, make it a good leaving group. So it falls off and makes a carbocation. And then maybe this proton to get lost and make an alkene. Uh, what's the reason? Anybody remember? Organic one, <laughs> chapter. Seven E one reaction. So it's maybe something with a proton on it, like H H H plus <laughs> acid, right? So like I think they used uh, HCl here. Whoops, HCl. So HCl is the reagent that. Um, that, you know, the reagent's very simple. I mean, and I'm not gonna do the mechanism, but in a nutshell, it's oxygen grabs the proton and then you get H2O. And then, so I think somebody said POCl3, that might work here, POCl3. Um, HCl is a little simpler, it's just acid. All you gotta do is make that a good leaving group and it'll it'll kind of fall off. POCl3 would probably do the, do the same thing actually too. But yeah, this falls off and then you have a carbocation, a plus charge, and then the proton here falls off. And that's what a E1 reaction is, right? Okay, so you make an alkene here. Um, they do something kind of weird, and I'll just mention it, I'm not gonna really talk about it, but they wanna remove the methoxy group. Uh, so they use quinine, Mm, quinidine, quinidine. 
this deprotects the methyl ether. Somehow this this is a like a quinine quinine derivative, which is like a, it's an alkaloid. It's like in tonic water, and I think gin even has it in there. Quinidine, but it, it basically uh, removes the methoxy group. I, I don't exactly know the mechanism of that, but uh, whatever. It's not not a very exciting reaction, but it does convert the uh, the uh, methyl ether into a hydroxy group. All right, so something that maybe it attacks the methyl, kicks it off. I don't know, something like that. Okay, and then lastly, lastly they uh, need to attach something on that oxygen. The, the last little thing, blah, 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 nitrogen, methyl, methyl. They gotta do that, right? They gotta convert the alcohol, the, uh, uh, the aromatic alcohol to this kind of ether thing. So any guesses? What's that thing called where we're, we're making ethers? The what? Do you put a leaving group in there? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's the same that we just saw that I think in the, uh, maybe the fentanyl synthesis or, or a fentanyl synthesis. Yeah, it's just, just imagine this with a leaving group on it, right? What's your favorite leaving group? You all should have your favorite leaving group. Bromine. Bromine or chlorine, yeah. Yeah, both of those are usually acceptable. Yeah, so it's just, uh, I think they used the chlorine one. Oh, it's actually, I'm sorry. The, uh, I messed up. It's an extra carbon there. So it's ethyl, two ethyl groups. Ethyl, ethyl, yeah. Okay, cool. So it's just uh, ethyl, ethyl, carbon, carbon, chlorine. This, that's it. The mechanism is tremendously simple. And it just attacks, makes a bond to the carbon and kicks off the chlorine and uh, maybe a base takes off that proton or something like that, but you get the ether. Okay. Um, there is a slight problem here, uh, a problem in the synthesis that when they um, when they made the alkene with the E1 reaction and they, they did these couple steps, they actually have a, a mixture of E and Z. Alkenes. A mixture of E and Z alkenes and um, Somehow they do a little bit of magic where they uh, crystallize it, uh, separate the Z, well, they want the Z, right? Uh, by crystallization. So they crystallize out the Z one and it just, you know, by, by luck, it just works. Crystallization is a, a magic trick that either works or doesn't and it works, you're really happy. If it doesn't work, you get really sad. But yes, they were able to basically make the Z uh, isomer of tamoxifen pure by recrystallization. So I'll draw, I'll, re I'll redraw. This is, this is actually what I'm drawing here is the E. This is the E, but of course what I'm trying to say is it's really a mixture of E and Z, right? They have a mixture, a one-to-one -one mixture or something of E and Z. But anyway, after all is said and done, they get their final product. With the, uh, there we go. There, that's Z tamoxifen, the good one. So yet another example of using, uh, well, using uh, simple organic chemistry to make these molecules. Somebody said, uh, because of their boiling point, 
um, there's a difference between E and Z. I don't think it's boiling point. I mean, the these molecules don't really boil. They they're they're uh, most organic molecules. You got to to boil them. You got to be at a uh, uh, oh, benzene nicely. Um, you got to that'd be like three hundred degrees Celsius or something like that. Um, it's it's something about the uh, something about the crystallization properties so it's it's getting into magic i mean it's like like the z just happens to crystallize better is that always the case i you know um no it's not and and it just kind of varies from substance to substance that the crystal properties and everything like that so i don't yeah i don't know i, I um this is this is a uh, one of those things uh it's trial and error <laughs> so you do it in a lab and you get really frustrated and they probably also had to like find the right solvents like maybe it's methanol or you know isopropyl alcohol they probably you know tried a hundred different solvents to get it exactly right because i mean they, they i think they knew that they needed this to be correct so they probably spent a lot of time getting this process right and and I, I don't know the exact crystallization conditions, I guess. Okay. Um, okay. So, so I, we're, we're kind of near the end of today. I have some other cool stuff to talk about, um, but I'm going to put that in the asynchronous component. Um, I'll tell you the the gist of it. The gist of it is this. And I'll just and I'll then you'll you'll get the next part of the story in the other lecture. But um, uh, so uh, this is the gist. <laughs> this is not active. So this, you consume this and it doesn't actually, this molecule does not have activity. This molecule uh, doesn't directly bind to the estrogen receptor potently. But the funny thing is it is a drug, right? So how could that be? Anybody know? Like how could this molecule, this, this structure, not actually be active itself. Um, is it a prodrug? It's a prodrug, that's exactly it. Now we talked about that before. The idea is that this is actually a, um, a substrate for metabolic enzymes. So this gets oxidized to the active drug. And so this is a prodrug, prodrug. And that creates some interesting stuff to talk about like where does it oxidize for one I'll, I'll tell you right now it's the this uh hydroxy group on the bottom left here becomes a or sorry this benzene becomes a four hydroxy so oh right there and uh and then and then there's some interesting stuff because what if you take another drug what if you take another drug that suppresses that oxidation? Like it, it, it uh, inhibits the oxidative enzyme, right? Right. What's gonna then? Then, you, then this is not gonna have the effect, right? That makes sense. That's kind of weird, and that's that shows the complexity of pharmacology, <laughs> right? That that I could take a second drug, like it, and it happens to be one of the ones we talked about earlier, uh, myconazole. Remember myconazole? It was a like a like a fungal antifungal drug. You take that, and that actually inhibits the enzyme that acts oxidizes this four phenyl group. That, sorry, this phenyl group to the four hydroxy, and and so it's a drug interaction, right? One drug cures your your fungal infection, but then it prevents this from working. So you have to kind of uh, counteract that somehow or or just you i mean a, a pharmacist or a doctor is going to know about these interactions and just make sure that you're not taking both drugs simultaneously that makes sense kind of cool it's interesting and it just shows the complexity of of uh you know drugs and pharmacology and uh, also um you know uh like being a doctor you have to really pay attention to drug interactions right Okay, so I'll just uh, record the other part of this lecture asynchronously. Um, I'm trying to, I'm going to try to have this go pretty uh, smoothly as opposed to last time. So it'll, it'll be up probably you know midday tomorrow. All right. Any closing questions? Yes, we have no questions. All right, guys. Well, it's uh, nice zooming with you. 
and um, I'll get that other lecture posted uh, ASAP. All right. Thank you. Have a good night. Cool. See you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.